Welcome to the F-Tier Nuzlocke, a challenge where I take what are considered the worst of the worst Pokemon and prove that one man's trash is all this man gets to use in his Nuzlocke. As the fourth addition to this series, I will say this was absolutely the hardest of them yet. Ultra Sun and Moon are no joke when it comes to Nuzlocke's, and it took a few attempts for me to complete a decent run. A change from my previous F-Tier runs, for our criteria on what constitutes for an F-Tier Pokemon, I did a stream last month taking input from some of you. You can check out that stream linked in the description, just use timestamps on that video if you want to see how that panned out. But in general, all Pokemon with 500 or higher base stat total were cut immediately, and then we just kind of started cutting anyone that at a glance seemed like they might be too good or have too much utility. Ultimately, knowing that Ultra Moon was going to be a slaughter fest, I wanted to make sure there were still a decent number of encounters available. If you want to contribute to future runs and help select my encounters, you'll have to subscribe and turn on notifications if you want to join in on some of my streams. Now that this run is finally up, the next tier list stream will have to be soon if we're going to do another F tier run in the coming months. Another small departure from previous entries in the series, Gen 7 has, like, so many cutscenes. Every five steps is a cutscene. And with them come a lot of necessary battles. I cut out the majority of the story and kind of boss rush styled this video because I couldn't really think of any other good way to edit this. I had quite a few suggestions from you guys to play these games, so I assume we're all on the same page with the story anyway. If you're not, play them for yourself. They really aren't bad games by any stretch, just not very Nuzlocke friendly. With my preamble out of the way, hardcore Nuzlocke rules apply, let's run with it. Our lowland journey begins when we get ambushed by a cute tiny rodent and three horrifying freak of nature monsters come out of nowhere to save us from it. Thanks, I guess? Professor Kakui shows up and demands we pick one as our starter. With no choice, we pick Litten only because I'm a cat person. And then as soon as we're freed from the clutches of the game's storytelling, we're able to catch our actual starter, Earl Grey the Young Goose. This brings up the first issue with this run. While I have a lot more possible Pokemon I could use this time compared to previous runs, a lot of those encounters double up in the same location. In this instance, we could have found a Baneri here, which cannot be found anywhere else before post-game, but since we ran to Young Goose instead, that encounter is locked away for the rest of the run. Though I suppose that tracks, since I'm not exactly known for my good luck. That lucky streak continues when we are forced by the professor and his assistant Lily to go back to school. We have to take on four trainers here and then fight the champion, I mean principal, in order to progress. But Earl is a brave little toaster and handled them beautifully with work up and stab tackle. We follow Lily to a city I cannot pronounce, Owly, where we encounter Chamomile the Furfrau, an awesome bulky addition to the run that honestly will overperform more than I ever could have gave her credit for. Which is good because our first major fight is against Alima, who is something known as a trial captain. As we journey through the Alolan and islands, we're going to be attempting what are known as trials to gain Z crystals and ultimately beat each island's head honcho, the Kahuna, and complete their grand trial to become the champion. It's a convoluted process, but trust me, we'll get there. Anyway, Alima's young goose can't do anything to our chamomile and falls into uses of her headbutt. Smeargle is KO'd in much the same way. Afterwards, on Route 2, we have a few possible encounters to find and get drowsy. We name her Herbal. Alima is waiting for us at the entrance to his trial site, which he kindly informs us only after agreeing to his terms and conditions has a bit of a rat problem. Well, uh, I'll say. I guess this is as good a time as any to mention how I approached level caps for this run. Gen 7 is weird when it comes to boss levels and battle mechanics. What I ultimately decided was the most fair was to keep a consistent level cap matching the next grand trial. This would allow me to be a little over leveled for totem fights, which I thought would absolutely be necessary since they not only have buff stats, but fight two on one as well. But this did still require me to carefully manage my team's experience throughout the entire island just to make sure I didn't go over my cap. Our strategy for this totem fight is to leap with Chamomile and spam Baby Doll Eyes, which is a priority move that lowers the opponent's attack until he falls low on HP. We purposely don't KO the assisting Rattata because if we do that before KOing the Totem, a new Rattata will simply take its place. Instead, we lower the existing Rattata's attack as well. Afterwards, we can switch into Earl, who is handily able to tank both Rats' reduced attacks with help from an Orinberry and quickly clean up the fight. With the Totem cleared and the trial completed, we are free to gain another encounter in the trial site, this one being Hibiscus the Rattata. We purposely won't be evolving this one because I decided I wanted to stretch the definition of species clause just a wee bit and allow myself to use Totem Raticate as a separate encounter just because because I probably won't ever play Gen 7 again, and this will be the first and only time I ever use a totem Pokemon. I think that'll be fun. If you don't like the rules I made for my own challenge, then go fuck yourself. Route 3 nets us Barley the Spearow before we meet up with Lily in Melee Melee Meadow. She asks us to save her little puff cloud monster that went missing, but these two clearly hostile alien types challenge us to a battle as we try to do so. A quick dog fight later and we've cleared the first island. Well, almost cleared. Now it's time for that grand trial I mentioned earlier. Kahuna Hala uses fighting types and really is no joke. He leads with a Machop against Chamomile, who leads the fight off with Baby Doll Eyes just to lower Machop's attack. I then realize the error of my ways, since Machop has the move Karate Chop, which has a high critical hit rate and will ignore stat drops. But it also loves spamming Revenge for some reason, so I guess overall it's still helpful. After a few turns of that, we swap into Herbal, who is crit immediately and misses the first Hypnosis. But the next turn, Machop goes for Focus Energy and Hypnosis hits. 
Great. Now we can switch in Barley, and oh, he woke up immediately. Well, we've come this far. The plan hasn't failed quite yet. Barley uses Work Up to buff its attack, and then is immediately punished with a critical hit revenge and promptly knocked out. A lot of setup for a strategy that ultimately didn't amount to anything, and likely wasn't worth it to begin with. Oh well. Herbal's Confusion deals half damage to Ma Chop, and then she tanks a non-crit revenge easily in return. A second Confusion knocks out the Problem Child. Against Crab Brawler, we get lucky on three counts. Turn one, he just goes for Leer, while we get a critical hit Confusion. And turn two, he goes for a second Leer, while we are able to cleanly KO. A roller has Pursuit, by the way, the main reason why I didn't want to rely on a Psychic type for this fight, but if he doesn't want to use it, then he doesn't want to use it, and that's alright with me. Makahita leads with Fake Out, which does big damage thanks to our defense being lowered, but activates our Orinberry, keeping us in the green. Next turn, Makahita just goes for Sand Attack. Okay. We KO with Confusion. I guess he is only the first Kahuna, but man, Hull, I feel like you had the one in the bag. But hey, no complaints from me. With our first Grand Trial behind us and a new level cap reached, Earl Grey evolves into Gumshoes, and we're free to make our way to the next island kind of. First we meet with a lowland Professor Oak, our ticket to a giant rat in the near future, and then we're forced to ride on the back of a giant manta ray because boats are just not an option. I'll make this very clear, there's a lot to love about Gen 7, there's a lot to hate about Gen 7, but no single thing feels as meh as Mantine Surfing. I don't hate the minigame, I do hate that it's forced on me. I think the idea of Pokemon riding in general is cool and fun, but what balances the scales most is that at the end of the game you are awarded with BP, which is exchanged for some okay prizes, some neat move tutor moves, but items that are effectively useless in this challenge. But, since Mantine Surfing is free and you can theoretically win an infinite amount of points from it, we do! This will unlock some tutor moves such as Fire Punch, Ice Punch, and Giga Drain, which you'll see me use from time to time. Otherwise, we're done here. Our next encounter is Oolong the Iggly Buff on Route 4, who we are able to evolve into Jigglypuff before our upcoming rival fight. This is Hal. He didn't come up in the script yet because he hasn't done anything really noteworthy, but he's around. People give Hal a lot of shit, but I mean, he's more of a rival than May was in Emerald, so... His Dartrix leads off with a peck, while Oolong confuses it with Sweet Kiss. He then harnesses the power of his crystal and what is the first Z-move used against us in this run. Z-moves are once per battle really powerful moves that we're going to have to be wary of moving forward. Not all major battles use them, but the ones that do can be scary. Another thing this game throws at Nuzlockers, random potential one-hit KO moves. Awesome. Breakneck Blitz lands a critical hit, but Oolong is bulky as a truck and takes it with health to spare. Our Orinberry keeps us over half HP and work up boosts our offensive stats in the same turn. My hope here being that we might be able to deal some decent damage with Double Slot before taking too much damage ourselves, but even after a boost, Oolong isn't cutting it offensively, and a Deciding not to risk a critical hit on Razor Leaf, we switch into Kamomile. After a baby doll eye, she gets up a work up herself before flinching the Dartrix with Headbutt and landing a two hit KO. From there, it's as easy as spam Headbutt since it one shots the rest of Howe's team. Afterwards, meet up with this punk, another kind of rival, Gladium. His Zorua and Zubat fall pretty easily to Hibiscus using Hyperfang, but against Type Null, we bring in a dog of our own and are again able to spam Headbutt while taking very little damage in return. The punk then runs off, shouting something about something, and we continue our way to meet the next captain, Lana, and begin her trial, which largely consists of herding fish downstream, which causes a giant spider to appear. Did did we just feed those poor fish to this monster? Araquanid starts with Bubble, which deals decent damage thanks to the rain that just won't stop. Oolong does confuse it with Sweet Kiss, but the giant spider summons a smaller spider to assist it for the rest of the fight. The next turn, Araquanid uses Bubble again, this time dropping Oolong's speed. This activates her competitive ability, raising her special attack, but even with that boost, Round isn't quite enough to KO the Dewpider. Then we get a little lucky with Araquanid hitting itself in confusion. I guess I thought even with the speed drop that Oolong would outspeed the Dewpider, but I have to remember, the Pokemon I'm working with suck. We take the Bubble from Dewpider and KO in return, with the second round. We swap in Chamomile next to take another hit from Araquanid. We then headbutt and flinch the spider for two turns in a row, but he gets his revenge by calling in Masquerain, who intimidates Chamomile and drops her attack. We work up the next turn to try to get that stat drop back, but just get paralyzed in the process. Masquerain uses Bug Bite, but we're holding a Berry Juice to avoid it being eaten during the fight, which is good because it activates after getting doubled into, keeping Chamomile at half HP. Headbutt the next turn drops Araquanid to red, but Chamomile is too low for me to risk keeping her in another turn. We switch in Earl Grey, who once again is able to come in and clean up the fight with a series of fortunate attacks. But totem fights only get tougher from here. As before, we get an encounter in this area, which in our case is a Paris, we name Macha. Then as we leave the trial area, we're stopped by the two weird alien people again, who attack us with an actual alien this time. But Chamomile makes quick work of it. These guys have kind of an important role later, but they're really wasted in the early game and just take the place of more grunt fights. Oh well, we'll come back around to them at some point. With that out of the way, we can find our next encounter on Route 7 of Salon the Finion, and one more on our way to the next trial that I actually didn't include in our original tier list, but definitely fits our criteria, a male sound it we name spicy. I caught him mostly as a joke, but hey, you never know. And then we're at the top of the volcano. Wow. Last time I climbed one of these, there were a bunch of dogfights going on and somebody wanted to murder hundreds of people. 
Good times. This is Kiavi. Probably not quite pronounced that way. But hey, he's a very serious trial captain with a completely out of character silly trial to clear. But once it is cleared, we fight Toad Marowak, the Ghostfire Menace straight out of Lavender Tower. We lead with Salon and successfully set up the rain while Marowak detects, skipping an attack for the turn, but calling in a Salazzle for support. Thanks to the rain of Swift Swim, Salon is able to move first and quickly KO the Salazzle before either opponent can move. Marowak's Brick Break then brings Salon into the red, but she did what she had to do in this fight. We switch in Chamomile, who does unfortunately take a critical hit on the switch in, with our Berry Juice keeping us just above half HP, so we've already taken a lot more damage than I want to risk. Pivoting slightly, we stay in for just one Baby Doll Eyes to lower the Totem's attack, taking another hit for our Trouble, and then switch into Oolong. She hits a Brick Break on the switch, and since I know she'll take at least two hits here, we can confuse the Marowak with Sweet Kiss the next turn before taking damage. Now I have to start making choices with consequences. My original plan was to lower Marowak's attack with Chamomile and then clean up the fight with Earl, but obviously that wasn't going to happen just yet. I take quick inventory of my team and switch to Hibiscus. There's a chance Confusion will allow a safe switch, and she'll be able to do enough damage that would make taking out the Marowak easy. There's even a chance she could survive, but I'm not in the position to risk Earl, Chamomile, or Oolong just yet. And Spicy, though able to take a hit, wouldn't be able to do much of anything and would only put me in a position where Marowak wasn't confused and I have to make the guaranteed sacrifices anyway. On the switch, Marowak actually just goes for Detect. Well, either way, that's a free in. Viscous does outspeed, and Crunch deals massive damage. If the Marowak just hits itself one turn, then... Oh, never mind, it snapped out. Well... Goodbye, Hibiscus. I did try, but a sacrifice not made in vain, as Earl Grey is able to easily come in, take one brick break, and return a KO with Bite. Moving on towards our last trial of the island, we find... Colrus? He's talking to those shady alien people. Makes sense. I swear to God, if I have to fight this fucker again, I will turn his insides into spaghetti and slurp him up meatballs and all. But no, actually, he just gives us a TM and is on his way, which, uh, well, I suppose it's not weird. He never really was a bad guy. I just personally have a vendetta against him, okay? Even weirder, he never comes up again, so... Uh, hey look, Matcha is evolving. We meet up with Malo next, who asks us to gather some ingredients, make some gnarly looking purple soup, and get attacked by a giant not mantis creature. Cool! We lead with Spicy. He's a little hurt because there's some small battles before this that I obviously cut for time, but he still starts strong with a flame burst that almost brings Lorantis to half right off the bat, only taking a little damage from Excisor in the process. Lorantis calls in a Comfey and then starts to heal herself with Synthesis. I have a feeling I know exactly what kind of fight this is gonna be. Comfey raises Lorantis' defense with Flower Guard, but that should be fine as long as we're hitting on its special defense. This back and Fourth continues until I have Spicy use Smog instead, trying to poison the Lorantis to at least start some chip damage, but no dice. Fortunately, Comfe comes through for us and sets up the sun. Now our fire type attacks will deal more damage, but Lorantis will also heal more. Hooray. On top of that, now Comfe is healing Lorantis too. A sun boosted flame burst does knock it all the way down to red, which is of course healed up the next turn and dropped once more. This will go on for a while. Or actually, Lorantis will fall this turn. Huh, that's about time we high rolled. Only a Comfey left in the way and a quick smog and flame burst taken out. Who needs Salazzle? With the trial over and done, we can get our next encounter with a Comfey ourselves, named Floral, who makes a strong addition to the team. Now we can make our way to Coney Coney City, where we can go on a quick shopping spree and most importantly, pick up a fossil of our choice. According to our available Pokemon, we could get either a Lilip or Kranidos here, but since the Skull Fossil is Ultra Sun exclusive, my favorite fossil weed joins the fray after we rush to get him revived. And yes, I called him a weed. He looks like a barnacle coral thing, but he's grass type. He's a goddamn deranged dandelion, and his name is Kombucha. Now, before we jump into the next trial fight, I feel like this is as good an opportunity as any to introduce the two groups running around the islands with us. That's right, this game's ridiculous amount of cutscenes is thanks to the sheer number of different characters they make you keep up with. Anyway, the guys in white are from the Aether Foundation. Their whole shtick is saving Pokemon, working in a perfect Pokemon sanctuary in paradise, and conducting morally ambiguous experiments on those same Pokemon in attempts to open portals to the far reaches of the multiverse. They're pretty cool in my book, and get a pass. The guys in black are Team Skull. They've actually been everywhere up to this point, and the the fact that they always got cut should tell you how annoying and pointless they are to the overall plot of the game. They're just kind of troublemakers and do the usual stealing Pokemon thing, much like they're trying to do now, I think. So we sort out the tiff between those two and are confronted by Team Skull's second in command, Plutmeria. She takes her job very seriously as the sole admin of the most ridiculous, evil team. At least up until this point in the series. They got bailed out pretty hard by Team Yell. Lemuria leads with Golbat and immediately confuses Earl Grey, but we retaliate with a fire punch for almost half. Not caring to risk confusion, we switch into Chamomile, who gets confused again and hit ourselves in the same turn. We stay in one turn, we take a hit, retaliate back with Headbutt, switch ourselves back out to Earl once again, who gets confused, hits himself in confusion. Oh, okay. Getting annoyed, we stay in, take decent damage, and heal back up with a citrus berry, but again, hit ourselves in confusion. We switch back back out to Chamomile again, get confused again, and hit ourselves again. Deciding fuck it, I switch into Salon, who probably doesn't take two hits, but maybe we'll get lucky and it'll go for Confuse Ray again. But nope, we take two hits, survive on exactly one HP, holy shit, 
eat a berry, and KO with Water Pulse. Well, that sure was something. Against our Saladit, we switch into Kombucha, who easily takes a Flame Burst on the switch. And even though he gets poisoned the next turn, Ancient Power grants the most unnecessary stat boost ever, and we grab the easy two-hit KO. Messy, but deathless the same way I enjoy my cake. Let's be a little more careful in the Grand Trial fight, eh? Olivia is the kahuna of this island and specializes in rock-type Pokemon. She leads with Anorith against Floral, and the plan here is to take as many turns as we can to bolster our attack, and then strike back with a priority Giga Drain thanks to Floral's triage ability. This will allow us to heal all the damage we take with one massive attack. But Anorith has Metal Claw, which may cut that plan short just by a little bit. We do get two growths under our belt, and then blast off a solid two-hit KO and take out the Anorith before it can do more damage. Lilip is a good bit bulkier, but doesn't doesn't really have any offensive presence against Floral, so we lead off with a Sweet Kiss to confuse it and tank a Giga Drain in return. The next turn, Olivia uses a full heal to remove the confusion, but we get off a free Giga Drain in exchange. Eventually, we spam Giga Drain enough times to take down the Leap, and never mind, she actually had a full restore. Well, I'll take the opportunity to set up growth, I suppose. Twice more, in fact. Then our Giga Drain can finally KO the Lily. And now with four boosts, once Olivia sends in her Lycanroc, it doesn't even have a chance to move before we take it out with a priority Giga Drain. Second Grand Trial complete. Then we're given the chance to travel to the Aether Paradise, that Pokemon Sanctuary I mentioned earlier. And by given the chance, I do mean forced. But we do get a chance to meet with Luzamine, resident crazy person and terrible mother. Then a wormhole opens up in the fabric of reality and a weird jellyfish pops out, ready for a beatdown. After which, it disappears back to wherever it came from, presumably. I don't know, I didn't check the wormhole coordinates. Then the alien guys show up with an ominous warning about a being that's going to consume the sun or something like that. Very cool of them. I like having decent warning before the apocalypse hits. Unfazed by something as simple as life as we know it ending, Hal challenges us to another fight as soon as we step foot back on the next island. Fortunately, Chamomile with plus two attack is enough to take down both Dartrix and Raichu. Then we switch in Macha against Tauros, put it to sleep, and two shot with Leech Life. Then we bring in Kombucha against Noibat to take it out with a quick ancient power. Against Vaporeon, we first switch in Salon, and then I quickly realize that yeah, we can't do anything to you either. But after a bit of chip damage with Gust, we switch into Earl Grey, and he quickly cleans up the Vaporeon. We're supposed to be meeting the professor inside the melee garden, so we head there next, tell him about the world ending prophecy, and he just kind of laughs and heads out on his way. Strange guy. But we get an encounter here too. Hoping for a Goldeen, we of course find a Basculin instead. We name her Black Currant and send her to the PC for now. Then we get another encounter on Route 10, where we pick up Chai the Ariados and hop aboard a bus to Mount Hakulani, where the next trial awaits. But first, we do get one more encounter at the top of the mountain. Something fun, like Minior, or Elgium, or... Ditto. We name it Sentra. We meet Sophocles, who needs help electrocuting his insects, so we happily oblige, and that lures out a giant rat. I'm starting to sense a theme with some of these trials. We have our lead Floral out first and try to confuse the totem, but it protects itself for an old turn. Then it summons an Escarmory, and we're off. Switching in Kombucha, he takes an Iron Head from Togedemaru and Torment from Skarmory, but equipped with his Eviolite, and he's probably fine. Until he takes a second Iron Head and flinches, at least. <sighs> Time to switch to Chamomile for the tried and true strat. Unfortunately, she gets tormented and can't spam baby doll eyes, but that should be fine. Knowing the Togedemaru is going to shield itself, we just bite into the Skarmory on off turns to deal some minor damage. After a few turns of this process, we switch into Black Current and double Aqua Tail into Skarmory to take it out. We also get off one on the Totem before switching to Matcha, who easily takes the incoming Zingzap. But then Togedemaru shows it can bounce, which we uh, definitely don't want to take, so we switch back into Floral. We finally get off a Sweet Kiss and get the Totem confused, but taking two Iron Heads in the process may not have really been worth it. Fortunately, thanks to Synthesis, we can stay in and keep tanking his hits while keeping it confused. We also get a few growth turns in to boost our special attack. This thing does end up hitting itself once, and finally we're free to Giga Drain for some decent damage. We keep up this process until we're able to finally take out the Token tomorrow with the final Giga Drain, saving our last PP until he comes down from a bounce. Now out of power points, we switch to Earl Grey to take out the recently summoned Dedenne, and the trial is officially over. We then rush back down the mountain to reunite with the Professor, and he's down to a round of fisticuffs with Team Skull's head boss, Guzma. Of course, instead of fighting him himself, the professor volunteers. Me. His lead, Glycopon, has massive attack and defense, so we lead with Floral and confuse it with Sweet Kiss to try to give us some free turns. Not that that ever really worked out for me before, and this time is no different. Ditching the Floral strategy, we gain a free switch to Matcha thanks to his dry skin ability eating up Glycopon's Razor Shell. Then we can use Spore to not only put the monster to sleep, but avoid Sucker Punch damage in the process. After two Leech Lifes, though, Glycopon takes half damage, then forces to switch out thanks to his emergency exit ability. Against Masquerain, we switch to Chamomile to take the incoming Air Slash. We're able to get a decent hit off with Headbutt, but Bug Buzz drops to a third HP and we're forced to switch. Black Grant comes in, drops to five HP, and nopes the fuck out of there. Earl Grey is next up to bat, and he's obviously amazing, taking two hits and KOing the Masquerade with a quick and easy fire punch. Against Galisopod again, we can easily switch out to Kombucha, take the hit, 
force him into either using Sucker Punch or Razor Shell, and switch in Matcha again for free. Rinse and repeat, put the monster to sleep, and KO with a few uses of Leech Life. Moving on from those adult squabbles, we find the Aether House. A little Aether outpost for research purposes, I guess? It's here that we meet Acerola, the next trial captain. She leads us to a ruined and abandoned shopping center in the middle of a storm, where she certainly won't murder us, and tells us to go inside and hunt down some ghosts. So we do. Once inside, we're almost unalived by a puppet that feels a little too close to FNAF for me to be comfortable. Right away, I know this is going to be a tough fight. Mimikyu is a free substitute at the start of it, and crazy strong offensive stats, and all the hell of Pokemon it can summon have status moves to cripple my team. Chamomile does her thing, gets off just two baby doll eyes before taking multiple play roughs, a will-o'-wisp, and a curse. Then we switch in a floral, set up a growth, and KO the Banette first thing. Floral works really well here because its attacks won't be lowered by the burn or stat drops from play rough, and when Mimikyu calls in Jellicent, we should be able to take it out rather easily. We also use a sweet kiss to try and buy me time to heal, but the totem is holding a Lumberry, which I didn't really know was possible. So we sweet kiss again, heal the next turn, and Mimikyu actually does hit itself in confusion and breaks its own disguise. Finally, some good luck on my side. We spam a few Giga Drains until Jellicent comes in, then switch targets. We almost take it out in one hit, which is unfortunate because it uses Grudge against us, dropping Giga Drain's PP to only two. We do take out the Jellicent, but this activates his cursed body ability and locks us out of even using our last Giga Drain. So we get off one last sweet kiss into the Mimikyu and switch ourselves out of Salon. He takes most of Mimikyu's attacks well and can spam Water Pulse until the totem eventually falls. Another trial complete, which means we get to quickly grab ourselves Black the Shuppet before leaving the creepy supermarket. But as we make our way back to the Aether House, we're met with a Team Skull ambush led by none other than Pumeria. Battle after battle after battle. Starting off with Chamomile versus Golbat, we don't have any kind of issue here. Simply starting off by dropping the bat's attack and taking it out with a few headbutts. Against the Lazzle, I'm pretty sure we can take one hit, so we stay in to deal half damage with headbutt, but now we're forced to switch out. We don't have a particularly safe switch, since anything I bring in will be outsped the following turn and have to take two hits, as seen here when I first try with Earl. But we are able to get Kombucha in, who actually can take two hits thanks to his bulk. Sludge Bomb on the switch and then a follow-up Flamethrower, and the Ancient Power we get off just barely misses the KO. But if the AI purposely went for Flamethrower against the Leap, it's probably going for it again here, right? So Floral can switch in and, oh my God, we lived. Oh my God, we didn't. Well, the idea was to quickly KO with Priority Giga Drain, but uh, well, that's unfortunate. Salon is able to come in now and pick up the KO with Water Pulse, but man, that was a tough loss. Floral was so much better than most of our other Pokemon, maybe too good. Maybe that's why she had to die. But we still have a run to finish. Before we move on, we bring back Oolong to the team to fill out our fairy type need and evolve her into a Wigglytuff. Now it's time for revenge on Team Skull for what they've done to us. We break into their base of operations and track down Guzma to take him down. He leads Glycopod again, and the best thing we can do is tank its hits with Chamomile and try to reduce his attack. He'll stay in until Emergency Exit kicks in, so the trick is going to be to try to get as much damage in before then as possible so that we can priority kill it later. We switch to Oolong and paralyze it with Thunder Wave. Now it's for sure crippled. Oolong takes quite a beating, but thanks to a Citrus Berry, he's able to hang in there and get off two Psychics, getting Galaxpod down to red before Emergency Exit switches him out. Now Masquerain is in, and Intimidate activates Oolong's competitive. We resist Bug Buzz and should live one Air Slash, so we stay in and hit a strong Psychic, bringing the Insect down to a third of its HP. Too low to stay in, we switch into Salon, take an Air Slash in the process, but stay above half HP thanks to a Citrus Berry. Now, since we outspeed the Masquerain and it shouldn't be able to KO us, it might be baited into going for Icy Wind to try to slow us down. Unfortunately for Guzma, we set up Rain in the same turn, doubling our speed with Swift Swim, and raising the power of our Water Pulse, which is more than enough to take out Masquerain. The Lysopod is out next, and it has priority of first impression, so we switch out to Black, then we KO with a quick Sucker Punch. Now we have to deal with Guzma's scariest Pokemon, Pinsir. If we leave out Black, he'll get immediately KO'd by Throat Chop, so we switch out to Matcha, but in retrospect, I probably should've just swapped straight to Chamomile. Doesn't matter much either way, we bring in Chamomile on the expected deck Scissor and are faced with a hard choice. Everyone on the team is in danger from this thing, all I can do is find a way to cripple it. If we stay in to drop his attack, Pinsir will retaliate with a Storm Throw and KO Chamomile. Chamomile has been invaluable so far, and I don't know how we continue without her, but hard choices need to be made. We lower Pinsir's attack with Baby Doll Eyes, and then she falls. But unfortunately, that isn't the only sacrifice we need to make. Pinsir Storm Throw will always crit, so the lowered attack doesn't make that move any less dangerous. This means Kombucha will still be in major danger if switching in, and poor Matcha is simply too frail to take an next scissor even after the damage reduction. We bring in Salon, and since we outspeed, the idea is to weaken Pinsir to the point where he can clean him up before he's able to do any more damage to us. Two Water Pulses bring him down to half HP and land a Confusion as well. But unfortunately, Pinsir hits through the Confusion anyway, and Salon falls as well. But all part of the plan. Black is able to come in next, launches off a Shadow Ball, and we're almost there. Thanks to the attack drop, Black easily survives the next Throat Chop and heals a Citrus Berry. The next turn, Black outspeeds and drops the bug with a second Shadow Ball. By no means a perfect fight, but a survived one. I guess sometimes when chasing revenge, you end up hurting yourself more than anyone else. Maybe there's a lesson to be learned here. But we don't have time to dwell on that. We have all the stickers we need to unlock my precious prize Raticate. 
who we named Ginger. She is perfect in every way. God, I love having a huge rat on my side for once. And not a moment too soon because it's time for the grand trial where we face off against Nanu the coolest guy this side of the Black Lagoon. He's a dark type user, big Sydney vibes. We lead off with Black against the Sableye, but quickly decide that Ginger is better suited for this and switch her in for free thanks to her immunity to the incoming Shadow Ball. Now the battle can start. Two crunches quickly take care of the good for nothing imp and Croc Rock is out next. We can switch in Matcha on the expected earthquake, but the next turn we end up pinning ourselves in confusion thanks to Croc Rock's swagger. So to avoid further danger, we bring in Oolong and though we get confused again, she powers through and confuses the Croc in her turn. One more switch over to Kombucha while Nanu pulls out the full restore to remove his own confusion, we get off a clean energy ball and finally KO the Croc Rock. Now I know Persian wants to get off his fake out in the first turn, so we quickly pivot over to Black, absorb the hit, and then switch ourselves back to Ginger while Nanu fires off his Z-move Black Hole Eclipse, and... Oh look, Ginger's fine, okay, phew. Now we can switch back to Kombucha, take the Power Gem easily, get off a couple of Ancient Powers to bring Persian down low, switch over to Chai while Nanu heals, and get off two X Scissors for the KO. Now hang on just a moment, I'm reading this script back, and I see I wrote something here about conducting morally ambiguous experiments. Did I read that right? The Aether Foundation? Really? So I recruit some buddies to go investigate, and investigate we shall. But gadzooks, we've been caught by a weird man in insect eyeglasses. He only has a hypno though, and it's more annoying than anything else, so the investigation continues forward. But blasted all these rooms are empty and <gasps> gadzooks again, it's that same strange man, and this time he has a squadron accompanying him. Fortunately, these fights aren't too hard, I don't feel like I need to go into detail with them, but Ginger does end up falling asleep to that damn hypno and this time goes down to a stray Focus Blast. This goon's Hypno didn't have a Focus Blast in the earlier fight, and I didn't expect that to change here, and well, it does. My precious rat, gone from this world as quickly as you came into it, but we can't let this loss stop us. We have a job to do. A bit further in and we find <gasps> Guzma, again, he must be working with the Aether Foundation. He leads off with his signature bed bug, but this time we have a creepy crawly of our own to bring to the fight. Chai starts off with a strong, super effective bounce, which crashes down a glass pod and immediately forces it out with its own emergency exit. Then, Pinsir is in next. Chai takes one stone edge fairly well, then bounces up again, bringing the nightmare down to just a sliver of HP, which is quickly cleaned up by a shadow sneak the next turn. When Masquerade comes in next, we swap out to Oolong, who takes two air slashes fairly well, and then flinches. Okay. But we do actually get to take two more air slashes and cripple them off with Thunder Wave and Sweet kiss, then we bring in the Earl as Masquerine hits itself, outspeed thanks to Paralysis, and KO with the Fiery Punch of Death. Big Man Goliath is out once again, and we're able to tank the first impression with Black, then switch back to Earl on the expected Sucker Punch, and take him out with Hyper Fang. And then, the corruption doesn't stop their friends, no sir, this line of evil goes straight to the top. Is that? Boy, howdy, gee, Willikers, <gasps> Miss Luza Main herself, opening a portal to the great beyond? Trust me, ma'am, you don't want to peer into the void. Reminds me of my time back in the trenches in 67. Oh, hey, a Pokemon battle. Loser means lead Clef and Bulls pit against Kombucha, two tanks going at each other, just like the war. The constant back and forth is enough to drive anyone mad, but Loser mean loses her composure first and brings in Beware. We switch to Bennett, expecting a fighting type attack, but he actually goes for a dual chop instead. Well, that's awkward. So we bring in Oolong and he goes for Zen Headbutt. Man, this guy is just all over the place, isn't he? But we do get him paralyzed before he can do much more damage. Well, I say that, but turns out the bear does have a fighting move and it hurts. But fortunately, when we stay in the next turn, Psychic does big damage and he also hurts himself in confusion. Psychic then picks up the two-hit KO. When Lilligant comes out next, we switch to Kombucha, but he takes a lot more damage from Petal Dance than I expected. Fortunately, our Citrus keeps us over half HP, allowing us to get at least one strong Sledge Bomb in before having to switch. We bring in Chai, expecting another Petal Dance, but Lilligant actually goes for Teeter Dance on the switch instead for whatever reason. That's fine, we can use Matcha for this. Leech Life does quick work of the Magic Singing Bush. Low Punny is probably Luzamine's scariest team member since it has all the elemental punches, making staying in safely quite difficult. Ultimately, we decide Oolong can take a Fire Punch, so we pivot around, but nope, Low Punny actually goes for Dizzy Punch for whatever reason. Matcha is literally six times weak to fire and you use Dizzy Punch. It's fine, whatever. If it wants to prioritize Dizzy Punch, then we can just switch in. Nope, Black takes an Ice Punch. Random move, got it. All right, well, we take one more, so we get damage in with Sucker Punch, then switch to Chai to a random super effective Fire Punch. Can I please catch a fucking break? Forget it, we bring an Earl whose expertise is clearly needed on this case and bring the bunny to its knees with Hyper Fang. No, not like that. Against Milotic, we make the easy switch to Matcha, eat the Hydro Pump for HP, and put her to sleep before healing up with Synthesis and spamming Leech Life until the sea monster falls. Leftable is back out, we put it to sleep and try to deal damage, but our attack dropped harshly from Charm. Then we switch to Earl Grey, try to Hyper Fang, but Clefable literally dodges it in her sleep, then finally get the KO the next turn. In her defeat, Luzumine opens a portal to who knows where, and Guzma, being the simp that he is, jumps in after her. No more evil... I'm sorry. What was that, Lily? 
That was your mother? Guess we gotta fish them out of interdimensional space. And who better to call for that than the Ghostbusters? But since they're not in this universe, we'll settle for the alien recon guys instead. They send us off to find an ancient relic of sorts to call upon the beast of the moon or something like that. Anyway, we need a flute and it's time to go find one. And to do that, we need to travel to another new island and track down a girl named Hapu who apparently knows where it is. But new place means new encounters, so we track down a grand bull in the Pony Wilds. Then, realizing we need to fill out our roster a bit more before any big bads try to take us out, we backtrack to pick up a Deden in Blush Mountain and an Oricorio on Route 6. For the record, we banned the other forms of Oricorio, but the Pau style is up for grabs. Meet Darjeeling, White, and Puar. But I make one small adjustment to our tier list. Going by my own criteria, I decide to ban Grand Bull mid-challenge before we use him in any major battles. Fairy typing, strong physical bulk, and intimidate might be a bit too good for this challenge. I love Grand Bull, but I already have so many other encounters, I'm pretty sure we can continue on without it. But with two new team members in tow, we track down Hapu, who takes us back to the harbor and connects us with the boat captain to take us to find the flute. To Exeggutor Island. You know, I don't know what I expected. Well, the first thing I do is catch myself a Tropius hiding in the grass. Her name is Fruity. Then we enlist the help of the resident executor to grab the flute off its pedestal, which clears up the weather for some reason. I'm not entirely sure that's how flutes work, but I also don't know enough about them to say it's wrong either. My lack of musical talent aside, we have the magic flute in hand and make our way to the top of the mountain to summon God or something. I don't know, I fell asleep through that part of the planning process. But for some reason, somebody put a trial along my path with no trial captain in sight. What kind of establishment is this that there is no management to be found anywhere? At least the totem is easy to find. Time to fight an angry dragon. We leave a fruity against the pissed off Como, take a poison jab easily, and immediately put it on timer with Toxic. And then the cavalry of Noivern arrives to add to the chaos. Knowing a flying type move is coming, we switch into White, who easily survives a poison jab and heals up with a citrus berry and cheek pouch. Then Volt switch off the Noivern and into Black, who resists the poison jab, but is unfortunately crit and poison. Oh well, just stalling turns. Now we can switch into Oolong, and both dragons go for dragon type moves, so we get in freely. Then Oolong takes a poison jab easily, though it gets poisoned by it as well, and paralyzes the Noivern of Thunder Wave. Then we stay in, knowing the Noivern just wants to screech for some reason, and Poison Jab still doesn't do enough to take us out. The Titan Komo falls, we switch Oolong to Puar, and Revelation Dance takes out the Noivern. Easiest totem fight yet. Now we're free to duet with Lily, who is hiding her own magic flute this whole time, and this causes her Puff the Magic Space Cloud to evolve into a giant bat demon. Oh, and Luzamine and Guzma just kind of like fall out of the sky. So, uh, mission complete! We found them! Oh, but Satan followed them straight out of hell. Satan and the bat turn to Harry Potter characters for a minute, followed by Satan straight up eating our bat friend and wearing his skin like a trophy. Yes, we should probably fight it. This thing is Necrozma. He eats light. He's the guy coming to eat our son. So I'm pretty sure the implication here is that Lunala, that's the bat guy, as an embodiment of the moon and therefore light, is just another meal on the buffet for Necrozma. Fortunately, a bit of poison, a bit of confusion, and white being more powerful than I could ever give him credit for is all it takes to knock him out. Of course, this only enrages the beast, and he somehow takes all the light from our world and then just kind of vanishes. So we do the only sensible thing a child should do when faced with a sun-consuming demon from beyond the stars and chase him down on the back of a flying god beast lion. Hell yeah. When we finally do catch up to the demon, he seems to have changed a bit. Maybe put on a few pounds, got a haircut. Good for him, good for him. Slight issue. This thing is just as terrifying as it looks, and he's far above our current level cap. Our current team doesn't stand a chance. But I've got a bit of a secret weapon up my sleeve. See, there's a few ways to get around this monstrosity, such as Endeavor Strats with a Focus Sash, but I have something better. The ultimate secret weapon. See, when I went on my encounter catching spree, I left out one Pokemon. The key to everything. The only one that makes it all possible. Kyuku Muku. This little fella has literally not a damn thing going for it. It can't attack, can't really do much of anything actually, but it has defenses through the roof. And that means even though this legendary overleveled beast can basically one shot my entire team, he cannot one shot Puku Muku. And that gives us a chance. We encounter the light demon and lead with Roibos, our Puku Muku. Yes, I'm aware I misspelled it. Instantly, Necrozma deals massive damage to our little teabag. Again, this guy has 130 base defense and special defense, and even he dropped to a third HP from a single attack. With our one hit absorbed, Roibos lays down her life and lets out a Memento. Memento is a move that will cut the offensive stats of the target at the cost of the user's own life. Roibos may no longer be with us, but thanks to her sacrifice, we have a real fighting chance. Then we can bring in Fruity, easily take a power gem, and Toxic the Giant Dragon. Now we can sit and spam Synthesis until the poison fully takes hold. Or we would if I didn't accidentally hit Air Slash and ruin the pattern. But I won't let this chance go, not now. All it takes is a little bit of switching around, and finally, the Toxic deals enough damage to fell the beast. 
Akrozma is defeated. With the light returned to our home world and Lily's mom back safe and sound, or at least in one piece, our side quest is over and it's about time we get back on track with completing our island challenge. And that means challenging this girl Mina, a trial captain, to a battle. We bring Spicy out to the fray again, leading against Mina's Mawile. First turn we were able to set up Nasty Plot and double our special attack. Then the next turn we were hit by Mawile Sucker Punch, but our boosted flamethrower quickly KOs her in a turn. Granville meets the same fate to Venishok. Against Rabombi, I'm pretty sure we don't outspeed speed, so we switch into Oolong, paralyze the Thunder Wave, absorb the Z-move Twinkle Tackle just barely, and confuse the B before switching out to Ariados. We take one Psychic, but retaliate with a strong Poison Jab for the KO. She then sends us off to fight a bunch of the previous captains, facing off against Dilema, Lana, Piavi, and Nanu. And I'll be honest, I really don't want to bog down the video anymore by reiterating back to back to back to back fights here. It's long enough as it is. I'll play all of them here regardless, so you can like replay this part of the video or slow it down if you actually want to see how each of them play out. I'll just let them play a bit. Do to do do to do. We do have one consequential death in all this, losing Macha to a Zimu from Alima's Kamala, but otherwise these fights go beautifully. Then we return to Mina, who summons a giant bee, and we're forced into our last totem fight. The totem Rabombi leads off with Quiver Dance, and we have Black go straight for the Toxic to get this fight on a timer. Then a Pelipper is called in as Drizzle sets up the rain. No matter, we switch in white, Rabombi dances again, and Pelipper stockpiles some defense. At this point, no matter who I send in is gonna have a bad time. Praying Rabombi dances again, we stay in a discharge, and white falls to a boosted dazzling gleam. I've got a funny feeling she won't be the last. We switch back to Black just to try to get some chip damage in with Sucker Punch, but even that fails when Rabombi actually goes for Quiver Dance this time. Oh goody. The next turn, Sucker Punch actually does get off, which means another Dazzling Gleam is coming our way, and Black is defeated. Not without his poison also taking out the Rabombi though, now we're free to bring in Kombucha, and three repeated Ancient Powers take it out cleanly. And that means the only thing standing between me and the Elite Four is one last Grand Trial fight. Before that though, we need to replace some team members, so we trek around for some other encounters, such as Decaf the Spinda from 10 Carat Hill, Mushroom the Shenotic from Route 11, and Mint the Carping from Vast Pony Canyon. Now we're ready to take on Happu ourselves, who is hanging around Executor Island as our last Grand Trial match. We can lead with our newly caught Mushroom against Hapu's Go Lurk, and promptly put it to sleep with Spore. Two Giga Drains make short work of it from there. Against Mudsdale, we get hit by a strong Heavy Slam that nearly takes out the poor Mushroom, and also renders our spore useless since the contact move activated Mushroom's effect spore and poisoned the horse instead. No matter, now we can switch to Black Currant, easily take the resisted move, and retaliate the next turn with Aqua Tail to take down the overgrown pony. Flygon for some reason only has two moves, so we switch to Puar to force it into using its dragon type move, giving us a free switch back into Mushroom. Thanks to our Citrus Berry activating before, we have enough health to take one Earth Power, and retaliate with Strength Sap to heal ourselves back to nearly full HP. From there, we put the dragon to sleep, get off a few Giga Drains to heal any remaining damage, and KO with Moonblast. Then there's some shenanigans happening with Hapu's Gastrodon lowering our accuracy and recovering damage, but let's be real, it's just delaying the inevitable. Eventually, Gastrodon falls to a Giga Drain, and our last Grand Trial is complete. But Gladian decides we haven't had enough yet, and challenges us to a battle before we can reach the summit where the Elite Four waits for us. His Crobat is met by Kombucha, and we take an Acrobatics while retaliating with Ancient Power. The next turn, Gladian switches out his bat to Lucario, but that's fine, as we can just switch into Mushroom, take a Metal Claw, and reduce his attack with Strength Sap while healing ourselves back to full. Eventually, Lucario falls to Moonblast. When Crobat comes back in, we swap over to Black Currant, take a Cross Poison easily thanks to the Citrus Berry, and outspeed thanks to Aqua Jet, and deal decent damage, but Acrobatics lands a critical hit on the next turn. Unfortunate timing on that, but at least Decaf is able to come in and take it out with a Sucker Punch the next turn. Then Savali comes in, and we should be able to take any hit from it, except that isn't Savali and it's going for night days. And it drops poor decaf down to red. Whoops, time to switch. We switch into Oolong and the Zoroark rips off its disguise to hit us with the Z-move Black Hole Eclipse, which we take easily. But somehow Zoroark outspeeds us even after being paralyzed. So we get in decent damage before switching gears and bringing out Puar. She can outspeed and takes out the Zoroark with an air slash. Then the real Savali comes out. We bring the mushroom in once more and eventually are able to put the fight to rest after a couple Giga Drains. Goodbye Gladion, I won't miss you. Finally, we've reached the penultimate challenge the Elite Four. Professor Kakui introduces us to the idea that we haven't done this at least six times before, and we're free to challenge the members in any order. For this run, again following the difficulty of these, my level cap for the Elite Four was the Champion's Ace. But that doesn't exactly instill me with confidence either. Our team of misfits was carefully crafted and chosen to counter specific members of each Elite Four, and I'll be honest, there is no plan against the champion. It took me a really long time to backtrack and find all the TMs and everything I actually needed for this, but if I was going to take on the Elite Four, probably one of the hardest vanilla games ever, I was going to do it right. For the sake of time, let's jump straight into the battles. Our first match is once again against Olivia, buffed considerably from the last time we fought her a full lifetime ago. Genotic leads against Armaldo with Spore and a bunch of strength saps to keep it contained. 
After putting it to sleep a third time, we switch out to Puar, who is decked out as our team's dedicated baton pass support. We tank a flurry of hits while raising our speed and special attack, then pass those boosts on to Oolong. You'll find that the little Wigglytuff that could is a powerhouse of TM usage, and basically has a different moveset for each member of the LE4. In this case, she comes packing Sunny Day, Solar Beam, and flamethrower. So now with a number of stat boosts under her belt, she is free to set up Sunny Day and unleash Solar Beam into poor Almaldo, who actually does her a favor by lowering her defense with Crush Claw, activating her competitive ability, and raising her special attack even further. When Gigalith comes out, its Sandstream takes the sun away, but we quickly set it up again and return a one-shot with Solar Beam. We took decent damage from an Iron Head in the middle of that, but absolutely worth it. Lycanroc is outsped in one shot, and Cridilly does actually take a Solar Beam, but lowers our speed with Rock Tomb, which of course raises our special attack. The next turn, Olivia tries to heal, but it isn't enough to get out of the range of Flamethrower. Chromo Pass is a menace. He is bulky as a truck, and I don't want to risk Oolong out against him since we can't one-shot. It takes some maneuvering, and this fight goes on for a while. But eventually, thanks to special attack drops from Mince Moonblast, Sleep from Mushroom Spore, and Sunny Day Blasting from Fruity, we win the war and claim our first victory. Healy is up next, a flying type user, and the entire reason why Mint is on the team at all. We lead off with Stealth Rocks and begin to spam Ancient Power while Braviary continues to Brave Bird. If we can get literally just one boost, we'll be able to absolutely sweep her team, but it never happens, unfortunately. Against Halucha, we take it out with one more Ancient Power and a Moon Blast, but we get poisoned by Poison Jab in the process, and unfortunately, Mint falls. But she did what she had to do. Now we move on to plan B. It's Oricorio versus Oricorio when we bring out Puar, and we get some fun shenanigans where we're just trying to build up boost but Kahili's Oricorio is using dance moves, so our dancer ability kicks in and copies them. Not something that comes up too often, but it was a fun thing to witness while we both get confused by the same teeter dance. But with two boosts behind us, we baton pass out to Oolong once again, this time equipped with Thunderbolt. We proceed to sweep through Oricorio, Mandibuzz, and two cannon all with ease. Next, we fight Acerola. Remember her? She didn't murder us that one time? Good memories. Anyway, we find out the hard way that we can't put our Bonnet to sleep, which like, I guess I knew, but also I'm so used to just hitting Spore at this point, I guess I didn't think much of it. So we get off some strength sapping before returning to Puar, who can only take two hits. But that's enough to get off an agility and baton pass out to Wigglytuff, who, you guessed it, is now equipped with Shadow Ball. Two uses take out the Bonnet and the following Frostlass. Delmai is a bit bulkier, but three flamethrowers are enough to burn him down. And by three, I mean four and a crit, because these trainers love their full restores. Now, Pelisand, we should have a two hit against, as long as we don't low roll twice in a row on Shadow Balls, but we do. Palo Sand survives with just a sliver of HP and hits back with two Earth Powers, which we also survive with just a sliver of HP. Holy crap! But now that Acerola is forced to heal, we can definitely stay in since we got the special defense drop and two-shot the castle, even on only five HP. Now against Driftblim, its only attacking move is Ominous Wind, so any normal type can eventually take it out without dealing any damage in our turn. For the sake of speed, we switch into Earl Grey, since Oolong doesn't have any special attack boosts, and Driftblim does have Amnesia to boost its special defense. And after spamming Fire Punch for a while, the balloon eventually falls. Malayne is the toughest member of the Elite Four, and why I saved him for last. We needed the extra levels. He uses Steel Types and actually has, like, really good Pokemon. Man has a Metagross and Prankster Clef Key, the latter of which he leads with. The most we can do is put to sleep with Mushroom, then switch out to Puar. A layer of spikes is put up in the process, but we should probably be okay. Puar is equipped with a Lumberry, so when Clef Key goes for Thunder Wave after it wakes up, we at least get one free turn out of it. Puar gets as many Calm Mind and Agility boosts as possible, using the buff special defense to take very little damage from Clef Key's Flash Cannon, but also weirdly getting paralyzed for, like, a lot of turns. But eventually, Mulane switches Clef Key out for Magnezone, and we baton pass out to bring in the one and only Oolong in the same turn. Flamethrower only misses the KO because of Magnezone Sturdy, but no matter. We take one flash cannon, and after a full restore is wasted trying to save him, Magnazone falls. Metagross, Bisharp, Doug Trio, and eventually even Klefki all fall to the sheer might of Oolong. The Elite Four defeated victory is in our grasp, we just need to face the champion. Or rather, there really isn't a champion, but how shows up to give us one final fight? Told you this guy was better than other rivals. Arguably, this puts him up there with blue, doesn't it? He leads the best Alolan Pokemon, Raichu. Fruity lands a Toxic on it. Next turn, we take a Psychic, eat a Berry, heal a Synthesis, and it's like nothing even happened. Next turn, we land a Critical Hit Bulldoze, and the Surfing Rat is wiped out. Crabominable is in next, and that means we have to swap out to Oolong, who takes an Ice Hammer surprisingly well, staying over half with Citrus Berry. But unfortunately, next turn, the Crab raises its attack with Power-Up Punch, and we only deal half damage with Flamethrower. There's not much on my team that will take a boosted Ice Hammer, so despite everything she did for us in the LE4, we let Oolong fall here, so the rest of the team can clean up this fight in her name. We freely switch out to Earl Grey, who outspeeds the monster and lands the KO with Fire Punch. When Tauros comes out, we switch into Mushroom, live two rounds of double-edge, poison the bull with our effect spore, 
and start destroying staff to lower his attack and keep us in the fight. When Taurus falls to red, we predict the full restore and put him to sleep with Spore. Now with his attack lowered, we can switch into Puar safely and freely start setting up our stat boosts. Then she passes the baton back to Earl, who takes one more double edge for his efforts, then picks up the KO with Hyper Fang. From there, Vaporeon falls to Hyper Fang, Decidueye to Fire Punch, and Noivern to Hyper Fang once more. How has no more Pokemon that can battle? Player defeated. Ultra Moon. This run was a very fun revisit to a generation of games I almost haven't even touched since their release. Thank you for the suggestions to try it out. I will say I'm sorry it took longer to finish this run than previous videos. There was just so much. And I didn't beat it in one try either. It took a few days to get a run that actually worked for the video. Obviously, I don't edit in failed attempts, but hey, those might make for good members-only videos in the future or something. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, I highly recommend you check out the last few F-tier runs I've done. At this point, I've probably played your favorite generation, but if I haven't yet, then you should let me know in the comments what game you'd like to see done next. Until then, thank you all so much for watching this video, and I will catch y'all in the next run. See ya.